right, welcome back to Debate 2017 happening here at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. My name is Joe Agay of KTN News. My colleague Lena Skaikai has been driving the first part of that debate and I'll take you through the next one. Now if I would request the Honorable Raila Odinga if you could take your place at the podium please. And please feel free to call me Joe this time because I am. Um, <laughs> but but if you, but if you're okay to, to, to handle it from there, that would be that is fine. That is fine. Okay, Mr. Odinga, we are speaking about national unity. That's the next topic that we are going to tackle in this segment. And a few weeks ago, you made a statement in Kajiado that has caused uproar in the country. In fact, uh, your opponent, President Kenyatta, who is not here today, has charged that this is a statement that could have. Uh, caused a threat to the country's unity, and you mentioned what to the effect What was the context of this statement, and do you now regret it, given the kind of conversation it has created in the country? John, on the contrary, I don't regret any words that I uttered on that day. I meant every word that I, I said at that time. I was addressing the issue of poverty of the people in that area. Those people are pastoralists. Ordinarily, pastoralists don't have to be poor. You see, in Botswana, for a long time, was running an economy based on pastoralism. And the, the pastoralists were very rich and very healthy. But here, because we have not managed it properly, KMC is almost dead, uh, so therefore, the, the pastoralists don't even have proper places where they can sell their, their, their animals and get the proper prices for it. So these people have been forced, therefore, to sell their land in order to make ends meet. Somebody's wife is sick, you want to take the wife for treatment, no money. You want to pay school fees for his children, it's no money. Uh, you want to put bread on the table, it's no money. Because of this, is the sales that only piece of land that he has in order to be able to make ends meet. And uh, therefore, he is inheriting his children. So I told him that we are going to make sure that you can live comfortably on your uh, 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 animals so that you don't have to sell land so that you become uh, destitute or your children become destitute. This is what I was talking about. And uh, I said, that this issue needs to be addressed through the issue of land, address it properly through TGRC report. And Mr. Odinga, I'll come to the TGRC in a moment, but you do understand that land is an emotive issue in this country, and you can understand if people who live in Kajiado, who are known Maasai, if you like, are jittery about a statement like that, because many of them seem to have understood it to be to mean that you would like them, when you take over, to leave that part of the country? Joe, I meant what I said. I never said that uh, people should leave. I said don't sell. In other words, there are people who have already bought. I'm not talking about people who have already bought, who have got titles and so on. I'm saying that we're going to reach a stage where it should not be forced to sell. But there are people who have got more, a lot of land in Kajiado. Those people with excess land should sell. Nobody is saying they should not sell at all. I'm only talking about people with limited amounts of land who are forced to dispose of those, the land because of economic reasons. This is what I never say, but Mr. Kiyata was playing politics. Oh, well, I want these people to be evicted and to go back to where you came from. I never say that. In Kajiado, there are members of so many other communities who live there, not only Kajiado, even Narok, uh, in several other places. I've never said go back to where you came from. I only was addressing the masses that because of your poverty, you have been forced to sell your land. We will deal with poverty so that you don't have to sell your land. Period. So if there's someone in Kajiado right now who's feeling worried about what you said that day, what do you tell them tonight? That they should live, uh, sit comfortable. They don't have to worry at all. Raila Odinga want to see Kenya as an integrated society. So many communities live in Kajiado. Just next door to where we are here, 
you have got uh, in this settlement called um, Ongatarungai. There you find very many kisses there. In fact, our member, our candidate for the member of parliament for Kajero North is a kisi. The, the current member of parliament there is a kikuyu. Uh, there are cambas, there are lawyers who live there. Uh, you, you have got uh, um, the Luos also who live there. So it is a cosmopolitan community and um, uh, people should live comfortably. You've got this the urbanization which is taking place in our country. People are migrating to urban settlements and this is, is a permanent feature of our development. This is an idea which you cannot kill. It will happen. Our society will be integrated. What is important is to ensure that each and every Kenyan, wherever they live, uh, uh, have their rights protected. I don't think that it even serves a purpose to create another tribe that now yesterday I saw that the, the Indians have now been given and classified as the 44th tribe of Kenya. Oh, oh, all right, we will speak about the Indians much later. But l l let me ask you about the TGRC because you brought it up. Your opponents, and specifically the Deputy President William Ruto, has said that implementing the TGRC is a recipe for chaos in the country. How specifically do you believe the TGRC will solve the problem of land, for example, in the country and historical injustices in general? Joe. We, this was part of the agenda four of the Serena process. So we, therefore, as a grand coalition government, set up the commission, the TGRC commission, which was uh, uh, an, like an international commission because we had commissioners from uh, Australia, from Zambia, from Ireland, part of that, that commission. And they traveled around the country asking Kenyans of their views about historical injustices. Uh, a lot of money was spent on that commission. So at the end of it, they compiled that report, uh, which details out the historical injustices from that other time. This is very similar to what they did in South Africa uh, when Mandela appointed a commission led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and that helped them to deal with the past violations of human rights under the apartheid regime and reconcile the South African society. That whole process has not happened in this country. So we, for a deputy president to go on record saying that a TGRC is going to open all wounds, uh, what is important is just to issue title deeds, basically exhibits his ignorance of the reality in this country. So, so walk us through this whole process. So assuming you get elected in the next two weeks, you get into State House, what do you do with the TGRC? How does that look like so that we can begin to understand how these problems will be solved through that report? When I'm elected, and you mark the word when, not if, I'm, I'm, well, I'm sure Kenyans will have something to say about that on August 8th. But yes. we can <laughs> okay. No. Um, we have said clearly as NASA that we shall implement the provisions of the TGRC report. By the way, the TGRC also is drawn from the constitution of the country. Part of what is in the TGRC recommendation is also in the constitution. Uh, which, for example, in the, uh, has got a chapter on land, and that con uh, chapter has created what we call community land. You've got community land, you've got private land, then you've got uh, public land. Now, uh, that community land is supposed to be administered by the representatives of the community, the county government, and the National Land Commission. The first thing that the Jubilee government did, President Huru Kenyatta, when they went, was to water down the uh, subsidiary legislation which were under draft, which had been prepared by the Grand Coalition Government uh, Ministry of Lands. 
uh, to go and amend those provisions and remove the power from the community and the county government and bring in the cabinet secretary. So basically, just bringing back the old system which was responsible for the mess that we have in the land sector today. We will ensure that this is reversed so that uh, the community has the a say, final say on the community land generally. All right, so, so let's talk about another issue that relates very closely to, to this, and this is the question of tribalism in this country. Many Kenyans know for a fact that when the elections are held in the next two weeks, most likely in Kisumu, you will have more votes than President Kenyatta, and he will have more votes than you in Nyeri, and that has happened over the last 50 years. From where you sit, what is the problem with this country insofar as tribalism is concerned? Why do we vote generally along tribal lines, and what will you do if you became president to deal with that problem? Joe, I don't think that there's something really very unique. Uh, some people are just naive. You see, even if you go to the U U UK, the country is owned. There is the, what is called the Tory safe seats and the Labour safe seats. The seats which are known are going to be won by Labour, the ones which will be won by the, by the Tories. If you go to the United States, see in the elections, some states are painted red, others are blue. Uh, that, that, that's, it's normal. But and in there's, fairness, there's also what is called. In fairness, Mr. Odinga, that is often driven by the issues that matter. There could be agricultural areas, there could be workers, uh, and that sort of thing. Yes. Here it's purely because it is Luos that live here, it is Kikuyus that live here, and therefore they vote in a different way. No, 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 Joe. There's also what they call their homeboy mentality. See? Like it's known that Clinton was going to win in a Kansas because he's a homeboy there. He grew up there. He's known better there by the people. So the fact that Uhuru Kenyatta will get more votes in Kiambu than me, because they see him, this is our boy, the homeboy mentality. But if we leave Kiambu, I go with him to the coast, I will get more votes than him in the coast. I go with him to Northeastern, I will get more votes than him in the Northeastern. I will also get more votes than him in Western. Those people don't vote for me because I'm a Luo, I'm their own. They vote for me because of what I represent. So that is where you get the balancing that after he has left his community, we now go to other communities who will vote merely on what somebody so, stands so for. So is tribalism a problem in this country, according to you? What is a problem here is ethnic inclusivity or exclusivity. That's what we want to address. Like right now, the Jubilee government has basically divided this country. They have basically have got two two people with their friends, not, not their communities. Because I would be wrong to say that uh, the president represents his community. Because uh, I know of a number of Kikuyus who don't believe in what is happening. They say that this is just uh, a club of friends and family members who are benefiting from this regime. And likewise, his deputy. So we are going to expand this uh, the governance structure in this country and be more inclusive to ensure that every Kenyan, irrespective of their ethnic origin, get equal opportunities uh, and, and that there's no community that is excluded. But, but Mr. Odinga, people who look at your own record often charge that while you were prime minister that your office had quite a number of people from your ethnic community and that as a matter of fact even in your politics there are people who are related to you who often get nominations to run on your ticket and that somehow your politics has also been defined by tribal inclined decisions. Joe, if you go and look at the list of officers in the office of the prime minister it was the most inclusive office that has ever existed. Because it was new, we started it, and most of the heads of departments came from all parts of, of the country. Even the junior staff in the office of the Prime Minister came from all over the country. So that allegation does not bear 
the reality on the ground. And the facts are there, you can go and, uh, and, and examine them. You come to people who are appointed. I did not know, Joe, that uh, if you are now in the government, you are uh, prime minister, then none of anybody remotely related to you can be employed by the government. I didn't know that. The only person who was employed was my sister who was employed as an officer consulate in, in, in LA. Uh, and she was a competent Kenyan, she got a PhD, and she was chosen by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, had nothing to do with it. But if I were to begin now, I don't want to impress President Uhuru Kenyatta if you want to look at this Jubilee government. But you have accused him, for example, of allowing his relatives to do business with government. What's the difference? Which relative of mine was doing the business with government when I was in the government? Well, he said yes. some were employed when you were in government. I'm, I just mentioned one case. Mm -hmm. I don't know which other one. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other one. Because that's the one they've been talking about. And that amount to be made too many. And th th that was also a junior position just a counselor, not an ambassador at all. But if you look at the, the, the government today, if you begin to, 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 do, to, 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 uh, to do a roll call, uh, I think the government will be embarrassed. So I don't want to go along that, that line. Okay. Mr. Odinga, you have about 1.1 million followers on Twitter, and there's a lot of hate going on there. And I haven't seen you, for example, use your Twitter handle to say something about it. There are a lot of people who say bad things to other Kenyans in your name. Joe, social media is a free media. You don't regulate it. You don't even know who is speaking there. Sometimes people put your name there and they speak on your behalf. So I, I don't want to interfere in the freedom of expression. People say all sorts of things that they want to say, and, and I don't want to regulate it. It's a freedom of expression, and, and it's something that is new. Maybe you people in mainstream media are also not used to it. Are you saying you, you have no responsibility there as a leader? Because there are people who say that social media funds violence. If, for example, there's violence in this election, that would be a very active playing ground, no? I hold no brief for people in the social media, but you need to know that social media exists also in the United States, in Britain, and so on. I see Mr. Caparo charged, talking about how he's going to guard social media, how he wants to stop them, hate speech, and so on. I hope this is not an excuse to do what they did in Uganda during the election time, shutting off the internet so that they could exclude social media. I think that is the freedom of expression which should not be interfered with. All right, Mr. Odinga, before we uh, move to the next stage where we'll open this to the audience here, I want us to revisit an issue that my colleague uh, Linus uh, touched on, and this is the issue of corruption as our next segment here. And you said that one of the reasons why the cost of living is rising in this country, and one of the reasons why you believe the country is headed in the wrong direction is because of runaway corruption. As president, if you get elected, what would be your specific role in the fight against corruption? Joe, corruption exists virtually in every country. The difference is that uh, in some countries, when it is uh, uncovered, action is taken uh, against the people who are involved uh, and, and that that is where we are different that's the reason why kenya ranks very high in the transparency international and the corruption index i think this now rank kenya as the third most uh, corrupt country in the world kenya is playing in the super league of uh, corruption the giants like uh, nicaragua um, uh, 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 Sri Lanka, DR Congo, and so on. But, but even during your time as Prime Minister, we still were ranked together with Nepal and Nicaragua. No, 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 we were lower. We were lower. <laughs> we, we, we have climbed much higher now. Uh -huh. But what was happening is that we kept on going lower and lower. 
uh, from where we took it, when we took over from Kano. But, but, but tell us, what, what as president you do? What I'm saying is, uh, the action is what is lacking. And here I say that the buck stops with the president. That action needs to be taken. When we were forming this NASA coalition, we sat down among ourselves and deliberated seriously on this issue. That's why you'll find it in our, our coalition agreement. You say that every member of this uh, club will ensure that they don't do business with government. Uh, and that includes also their, their relatives. And that action will be taken against public servants who are involved in any kind of corrupt act. If you find a situation where a president convenes a meeting in the state house to talk about corruption, and then admits publicly, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and this, this. what do you want me to do? I've failed. Basically, show experiencing failure. I say, Mr. President, the buck stops with you. Okay. If okay, you have failed, then pack up and go home. Well, that's fair enough, and that's, that's easy to say. But I have listened to the president when he speaks about corruption, and I think this is what he says, that he has uh, ensured his government has provided money to the agencies. He says all the commissions are independent, ESCC, Directorate of Criminal Investigations, the courts are independent, and that he fired certain people from his cabinet, which was within his powers to do, and that, based on what the Constitution says, there's nothing left for him to do. If you were in that situation, what is that other thing you would have done as President Raila Odinga? First, Mr. President needs to allow the independent institution to work independently. He took a, a list which had been given just for information, names which were still under investigations. And because he was in a hurry, he went and tabled it in Parliament. Some of those people had not been found guilty. There was no sufficient evidence against them. And he tarnished names of very many innocent people. Uh, then, on the other one, when we looked at that list, we found that a, a number of names were actually been missing. Some names had been expunged from it. And I challenged him. And I said there was a name here of the, then the Minister for, for uh, Revolution, which was here and has been removed. And I showed him where the, 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 the name had been removed. Then came the NYS case. And I told him, I know what is happening in Kibra. I know how NYS was being looted. And I said, the suspect is so-and-so. They came out and said, I should leave that lady alone. That I should face them directly, himself and his deputy. He could call a press conference in the State House. When later on evidence emerged linking that minister with that uh, scandal, Deputy President went to a church in Gidurai and said that that lady should stop speaking too much English. She must answer. You know, for your information, Joe, that lady is the candidate of Jubilee for gubernatorial uh, uh, elections in Kirinyaga. So what would you have done, Mr. Odinga? I would have taken action a la Magafuli style. I would have magafuli her. <laughs> so, so take the NYS case, for example. What would you have done about it that is different from what President Kenyatta did? NYS case? Yes. There was glaring evidence. Those companies which were formed are all fictitious names. They're basically uh, people who are fronting, or the people behind it. It's very easy to find out who is behind this company, this company, this company. I can't even tell you the individuals who were involved. I will ensure that action is taken, and that money is recovered and put to good use. I told you that the mega corruption of the GDP amounting to about 350 billion shillings. It's was responsible for our plight today here. Every Kenyan is owed 7,000 
500 uh, shillings by the Jubilee government. Every shilling that they spend, one shilling is lost, is going to people's private pockets. So they come up with budgets of billions and billions, billions. You put billions in health, billions in education, billions here. All those billions don't go to proper use. They're all misappropriated. I mean, a big chunk of it. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Odinga. We want to move to another special segment uh, uh, in our conversation this evening, and that has to do with the audience, the very patient audience that is behind us. And, and uh, my colleague, Lena Skaikai, is going to take the first question with the audience. That, that's right, indeed. We do have the audience seated in here, and we've also received very many questions by email prior to this debate. And we do appreciate the, the number of questions that we did receive. And apologize, it will not be possible to uh, have all those questions answered. A lot of questions directly asked to President Uhuru Kenyatta, and a lot of questions asked directly to uh, Honorable Raila Odinga. From the audience now here, let me bring in some of the people who are here to raise their questions directly. And first to go, Phyllis Omido. Phyllis, your question, please. Thank you um, to the organizers and uh, Your Excellency. We honor you for coming. Thank you for respecting Kenyans. Um, the, the largest contributor to climate change is carbon emissions. And this is mostly from large business projects that are very tragic, like the Lamu coal plant. Um, Kenya has had a maize crisis, which government has largely blamed on climate change. But even after acknowledging the contribution of climate change to food, food security, both manifestos uh, were silent on mitigation measures to our communities, uh, to the Kenyan citizens, especially the farmer and the poor. So um, even though I know your manifesto offered us um, a leeway in terms of environmental and social impact uh, assessment before setting up of projects, uh, would like to know in cases like the Lamu Coal project, which is a very tragic project to put up in such a place because of the impacts to the ecosystems and communities, what would you do as the executive to address this issue, bearing in mind that Article 69 and 70 um, is not affordable to communities, to poor communities like the ones in Lamu? No, no, I really want to ask question for him again. Right, that's fine. Uh, Phyllis will come back to you. Let's go to Flora Nyaga. Flora, uh, are you in? Please ask your question. Phyllis will come back to you. Thank you. My name is Flora Nyaga from Embu County. Honorable Odinga, please tell us how you have prioritized the main challenges that you will be faced with should you win the forthcoming general elections. And how will you translate this into realities in terms of solutions for the ordinary Kenyans? Thank you. Thank you, Flora. I think, uh, Honorable Dinga, you can answer that straight away. What are your priorities when you win the election in terms of the issues that uh, she considers challenges? Well, uh, she did not, uh, Flora, thank you very much. Um, you did not uh, enumerate uh, issues that you wanted me to talk about. We have got issues of the cost of living. You've got issues of uh, unemployment. You've got issues of corruption, uh, which are major issues afflicting Kenyans uh, at the moment. Uh, and we have got issues of devolution. Uh, let me begin first with devolution. We have stated clearly that when we take over, we will devolve more resources to the county governments so that they can be able to uh, meet the challenges that are facing them with respect to devolved functions. Uh, uh, so we said we'll increase it from 15% to 45%. And that is a commitment that we have. The regard to issues of uh, unemployment, uh, Forty percent of our population is unemployed. Uh, you can see roughly 12 million youths are out there on the streets uh, who are uh, unemployed. Uh, this situation is unacceptable. And we say that uh, we are going to look at areas where we can be able to create employment faster. 
And that's why I said we'll address the informal sector, where 13 million Kenyans are employed at the moment. This is a sector that is more elastic, where more opportunities can be created. You've said we're going to uh, set up uh, industrial parks in f uh, all the 47 counties, uh, which will give youth opportunity to be more productively engaged. Then they will have the facilities, the equipment, they will, pro will receive training so that they, they have the skills and they will have also access to capital so that they can work. Then the issue of the cost of living, yes. we will also address the issue of food production. What are you going for first, as soon as you take office? First, the issue of putting food on the table, reducing the, the cost of, of living for the people. This is uh, our priority number one. And uh, we will address the issues of, of uh, cereals, particularly unga, uh, so that we can be able to lower the price of, uh, of uh, maize flour in the country. We can deal with issues of sugar, with issues of milk, and so on. We deal with issues of wages, we deal with issues of um, uh, rent, as I've, I've mentioned. Uh, the issues of uh, the cost of transport, uh, particularly for the urban, and the housing issues. I, I'd like us to take as many questions as we can, so I'd like to bring in Josephine Mongare. Josephine, your question? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Right Honorable Minister, uh, Prime Minister. Um, my name is Josephine Mongare, I'm the FIDA chairperson. And um, as women of Kenya, we are felt very, very excluded in the current setup. When we look at your coalition, we look at the uh, Jubilee coalition, we do not see your women being prioritized and being at the front of these election campaigns. Now, seeing the data from the IEBC, women have only managed 9% uh, of candidacy. This clearly means that the National Assembly and the Senate will not make the one-third uh, constitutional requirement. would like you to share with us today, as women of Kenya, what are your strategies should your government take over? on the 9th of August, what strategies do you have to bridge that gap? One, in your government, and two, in parliament. Because we have uh, done what we could do as the women of Kenya to make sure that the current, the 11th parliament passed a law which was not possible. Now we are going to an election and clearly we will not achieve one third gender role. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, the issue of uh, women inclusion is very central to our policy. Uh, and the only way I talk about this, it is not just a question of women being uh, members of county assembly, members of parliament, members of the senate. We're talking about opportunities available for women in society generally. Because that's where you're going to absorb more women. Because we're talking about parliament, you're talking about just 350 something people. Uh, it's, it's pretty very few. There, what we need is to have a law passed. And as you know, although Jubilee had said they were going to do it, the parliament was uh, closed without them doing it. And in parliament, we had what was called tyranny of numbers. We as NASA were very committed to having that law passed. But we, Jubilee denied us the opportunity to do it. That's why it's important to vote wisely. Vote more NASA members of parliament so that we can go and pass the law that will then bring more women into all parliament. All, all right, Mr. Odinga, thank you very much. Our next uh, question will come from Malim. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, the Right Honorable Prime Minister. Malim. <coughs> yeah, Harun Malim. Uh, according to Kenyan population, 1 well, about 1.3 million Kenyans have disability. But World Health Organization, World Health Organization refute that and put about 6 million. And as a country, we have very full laws, the Disability Act, the current constitution, and even the Convention on the Right of Person with Disability. Unfortunately, up to today, there is no policy that operationalizes those laws to make services accessible to these most marginalized uh, communities. From 2006, national, national disability policy is still a draft. 
when you when, when, when you will be elected as a president in your first hundred days, what will you promise these Kenyans who feel, despite these great laws, they are still at peripheries in accessing the services? And I wish you good luck in your campaigns. Thank you. A very specific question, Mr. Odinga, about disability. We will uh, ensure that uh, the national disability policy is passed together with the enabling uh, legislation so that the people of, of, with disabilities can be adequately uh, catered for. When I was Minister for Public Works, I actually came up with the regulations to ensure that all public buildings are user-friendly to people with disability. So it is something that we are co genuinely committed to, to ensure that uh, uh, people with disability um, are given equal opportunity. Because as I believe, disability is not inability. And therefore, they must be given opportunity to serve the country. Thank you. And that will be the final question from the audience. Uh, Honorable Dinga, two more questions from this desk as moderators of the night. My first question to you, Honorable Dinga, is you come from a family, one of two families that have for the last 50 years plus dominated Kenyan politics. How would you respond to perceptions that these two families have held Kenyan politics hostage, literally, and with two characteristics. One family moving with a sense of entitlement in terms of leadership, and another with a sense of victimhood. Entitlement on the Kenyatta family and victimhood on the Oginga family. What do you say to those perceptions? I think they are very misconceived perceptions. First begin at the beginning. Jemo Kenyatta initially was a freedom fighter and he was imprisoned by the colonialists for nine years. Uh, uh, kept under very inhuman conditions. Jaramogi, on the other hand, became a freedom fighter and fought for the release of Kenyatta. And when Kenyatta was released, Kiyata then became the president, Jeremogi became the vice president. So they earned those positions by virtue of the fact that they sacrificed for the freedom of this country. So it was not like entitlement. The, the Kenyan people voluntarily elected them to those positions uh, at that time. They disagreed in the course of uh, implementation of uh, policies uh, during independence. And Jaramogi resigned from the government and went into opposition. The rest is history. Jaramogi became a leader of the opposition uh, and, 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 until he died. I, on my side, I was involved in the, what we call the second liberation. Not by invitation from my father, but basically out of conviction. And therefore, I was not in politics because my father introduced me to politics. I came into politics alone, and I've been in politics because of what I think is right for this country. As you know, I've also been in political detention uh, for a long time. You saw me walk away from that place because of that light interferes with me, and you see my eyes sometimes watering because of damages I suffered when I was in the uh, detention and the poor lighting in detention. That is what damaged my, my eyes. Now, I have continued on this because I represent the force for change the country. Uru Kenyatta then was introduced to politics by the former president, Daniel Arap Moy, who then picked him as his preferred heir when he was uh, quitting politics. So Uhuru came in by invitation uh, from his mentor, uh, former president Daniel Rapoy. But he then remained now an actor on his own when Moy left the stage. So he's also not here because his father brought him into the stage. He's a Kenyan. 
like any other Kenyan. So I think, I think it would be very unfair to infer that we have held this country hostage as families. I think you've answered the question and I will also be asking you about your relationship with Uhuru Kenyatta in a moment. But I think there's an audience question that we had skipped, Joe. Yes, and that was from Phyllis Omido. So we can do that before we wrap things up here. Phyllis. Thank you. So the biggest contributor to climate change is carbon emissions. This is mainly from big business, um, especially tragic projects like the Lamu coal plant. Kenya has had a maize crisis that government has largely blamed on climate change. And yet, even after acknowledging contributions of climate change to food security, all the manifestos were silent in terms of mitigation of impacts of climate change to our communities. Now, um, even though your manifesto gave a leeway in terms of environmental social impact assessment before projects, I would like to know that for cases like the Lamu coal plant where it's clear that the social environmental impacts will be irreversibly terrible for the communities. What would you do as an executive to protect communities from such impacts? Well, uh, we know that uh, the climate change is a, a major threat to survival of humanity generally. And that's the reason why it's an issue that must be handled uh, internationally. And, and that's why we, we have, as a country, made a lot of contribution to the debate uh, in the, on climate change all over the world. As a Prime Minister, I was very much involved in these matters. Um, we, as a country, need to take action to protect our environment, uh, to basically reduce the carbon emission coming from our country. Remember, I was in, responsible for conservation and protection of our water towers, which, which are five generally, uh, and, and several others. We as NASA actually have discussed that, that, that issue and that's why in our manifesto we're talking about uh, doing due diligence on projects before they are, are sanctioned. You are talking specifically about a project in Lamu. But I just want to tell you that um, coal plants still exist all over the world. You go to China, they are there. You go to Europe, they are there. In the United States, they are there. There's what is called clean coal. Clean coal as opposed to just ordinary coal plants. Uh, so that is an issue that needs to be looked at more comprehensively rather than just emotionally. And you know that uh, in those other countries, they exist, they just not just one plant. There are several plants. So the, the clean coal projects generally are acceptable uh, internationally. So this is what we need to debate. What kind of system are they putting up in Lamu? Because I know the environmentalists sometimes go overboard. You remember when we were setting up the Sondo Miriu project in, uh, in uh, Sondo, there was a lot of noise. Uh, the Tiamen plant in, um, in uh, uh, Kuali elicited also a lot of opposition. I think these are issues that we must look at on a case-by-case -case basis in order to uh, justify actions that are being taken by the government. If the Lamu coal is a, a, a project that is going to destroy or interfere with the environment, of course we will not accept it. So it depends on what technology they're going to use. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Odinga. We have two final questions before we allow you to make your closing statement. And uh, earlier on, you defended both the Kenyatta and Odinga family about their role in politics. And I now want to come specifically to your relationship with President Uhuru Kenyatta. In one of your many football commentaries, Honorable Odinga, you once said, in my presence as a reporter, that Uhuru ameanguka chini, sijui amekunyo nini. Which in effect was a suggestion about sobriety or drunkenness. 
Last week, a few weeks ago, you sat quietly uh, behind one of your political surrogates as he called Uhuru Mlevi and uh, DP William Ruto Mwizi. Now, to their side, very many times, speaking in his Kikuyu language, Uhuru Kenyatta has referred to you as Mogoroki and Kimudu, which in my little understanding of the Kikuyu language means a madman. The Deputy President calls you, not with, uh, in complimentary terms, Mtu wa Vitendawili. This is basically your language, the language of Uhuru and the language of Raila. Do you approve of this kind of language for this level of leadership? Two people with a mathematical chance of becoming president. I don't remember ever saying that Uhuru wa Menguka na sijia mikunyo nini. But uh, even if uh, I said it, it must have been with a light touch, uh, that uh, mikunyo nini. But, but uh, that will not mean that, that he is a, is a drunkard at all. Um, and when you, you talk about one of my, you call, it, you, you call him my surrogate, or, uh, I, I think you, that is not a fair comment on a honorable member of parliament, if that is what you, you mean. I mean, there are political jokes. If somebody says that uh, the, the vehicle is being driven by a, a drunkard driver and, uh, and uh, a tanboy who is uh, a thief, uh, I, I don't think he was meaning a huru to unless they themselves feel guilty. <laughs> I think that is just just to say that with a light, light touch. Politics must come up with some um, uh, jokes. And like when a huru refers to me as Kimundumuguruki, uh, I don't think he means it. I don't think he thinks I'm a madman. But that basically means that the kitchen is too hot for him. <laughs> so if the kitchen is too hot, get out <laughs> of the kitchen. See? And uh, the deputy president, Ateo William Zeo of it and a You see, that, that means there's something that is issuing him about it and a And I say that Piripiri Shoila, Yakuashani, uh, if you have, you're having a, a problem with it, just uh, leave it. So we in, in, in NASA, we basically uh, respond seriously to allegations that are made, but we also respond in, in, in kind and sometimes in jokes. If the debris becomes very irresponsible, we, we tell them what we think should, should be right. That is politics, uh, in my view. All right. Th thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Odinga. Finally, there are a lot of Kenyans who are worried about the election we will have in the next two weeks. As a matter of fact, there are Kenyans who are stocking up. There are Kenyans who are making plans to travel to different places. There are even some foreign missions that are issuing some travel advisories around this election. Do you share those concerns, Mr. Odinga? I uh, would l love to inform Kenyans that... Uh, Kenyans have a, a constitutional right to participate in these elections. I think there's some scarecrow. Some people are basically trying to scare Kenyans because they want to deprive those Kenyans of their constitutional right to vote. So people are being told, oh, there's going to be violence around. Some notes have even been written threatening some people so that the people can run away, particularly from urban areas to go to safety. I have urged our supporters not to fall to this, that they should stay put. I don't see any problems happening. Uh, we have said that there will be no violence in Kenya so long as elections are free and fair. And the government has assured us that they're not going to interfere. The IABC has assured us that the elections are going to be free and fair. So we should not be scared People should not run away from uh, where they're staying, because by running away, you are actually depriving us of your vote, either Jubilee or, 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 or NASA. 
So we want these elections to be won fairly. And we, we want Jubilee to also desist from trying to manipulate the electoral results, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, using the security forces. To, to, we want to win fairly. And if we win fairly, fine. You have also said that in the unlikely event of us losing, we will congratulate Jubilee. They've been asking all the times, are you going to accept results? We'll accept free, fair electoral results. Outcome. If they are free and fair, we'll accept them. All, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Odinga. Well, we, before you leave. We will we welcome you to make your closing comments. Thanks. Let me stand up here. Two, uh, okay. two uh, groups of people I did not address. One issue of housing, I did not address it in the context that we are discussing it as NASA. That we are going to invest heavily on low cost housing that is affordable to the population. Yeah. So, uh, Please use the microphone. Yeah. 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 That we are going to invest uh, as uh, NASA in low cost housing which is the problem right now. That's why people are having issues in the slums. That our youth can get decent housing when they get married as families. Uh, that happened in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Malaysia. Okay? The other one are the uh, single mothers. These young ladies who either have divorced or their husbands have died or they just got children. These mothers are having serious problems bringing up families. We say that we are going to pay special attention to this group so that they can be able to access capital, so that they can be able to do business or get employment, so that they can be able to look after their children properly. Finally, I just want to start Kenyans that we are on the brink of history as a country. It has been a long journey to reach where we have reached today as a people. 8th of August is going to remain in the annals of our history as a very historic day for our people. Every Kenyan who is able, who is registered as a voter, must turn out to cast their vote to participate in history making. I'm sure that at the end of the day, Kenyans are going to emerge victorious. So we urge you, whether you're a Jubilee supporter, if you're a NASA supporter, turn up and vote for us. Because Nane Nane, will remain forever a very important day in your life. Thank you very much. Asante ni sana wa Kenya kwa kunisikiziza. Ni ijuta ya kwamba ndugu yangu huru kinyata hakukuja. Ningependa sana akai pale. Nieleza yale maneno yote akisikia. Apate fursa ya kujibu. Lakini mani wacha peke yangu. Aminiweka shere. Lakini leo ameweka boya hapa lakini vijana haya mimi namtakia kila laheri na hata na, na rafiki yake bwana Ruto natakia waheri nasema hiyo michezo mchuo kwani itakuwa ya kirafiki na yule ambaye atashinda ashinde na siyekubali kushindwa sio mshindani shukran asante sana all right all right all right thank you